And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, because the accuser of our brethren is cast out, who accused them before our God day and night. Words taken from the Apocalypse and from the lesson used for Our Lady of Lourdes, February 11th, her feast day. During the night of March 24th, 1858, St. Bernadette awoke, feeling the familiar push, God's gentle urge to go to the grotto. She only went when she was pushed, moved by God. Early in the morning of the next day, March 25th, the Annunciation, she and her parents rose up together and went to the cave of Masabiel. Amazingly, there were some hundred people there when they arrived, early in the morning. And also, already present, to Bernadette's surprise, was the beautiful lady. She was already in the niche, smiling at the devoted people, praying and lighting candles down below. That was the first time that ever happened. For her part, Bernadette had been practicing for this day, hoping she would have yet another opportunity to fulfill the request of the priests to know the name of this most beautiful lady, this heavenly woman. After four tries, Bernadette kept trying. She tried again, what's your name? She tried four times and the lady stopped smiling, slipped her rosary over her right arm, folded her hands and extended them toward the ground like our miraculous medal. And then she looked up into heaven, sort of like the priest at mass, at the canon, raising her eyes up to heaven, pronouncing with humble solemnity, I am the Immaculate Conception. And then she immediately disappeared, smiling. Bernadette ran to the pastor as quickly as she could, repeating the wondrous phrase over and over again, I am the Immaculate Conception. Later, when she acted out what she had seen and heard, a thrill went through the crowd. Some shed tears at the sight. As we just heard, the last verse of the 11th chapter of the Apocalypse speaks of Our Lady, of the Ark of the Covenant as being in heaven. We heard, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of His Testament was seen in His temple. That's the body of Mary in heaven. It's one of the proofs of the assumption in the Scriptures. Well, this same passage then goes on to speak of how there were voices issuing from heaven. Voices. So we heard, and there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail. Voices, voices from heaven. Hmm. Voices have been heard from heaven many times in the history of the church, including most especially the sweetest of all voices, that of the ark itself, the voice of the blessed mother of God. As wonderful as these heavenly utterances are, however, and without doubt they are truly awesome and terrible, we must nevertheless be careful in how we listen to them. God wants us to be careful. In his first letter, St. John says, Dearly beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, if they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. The Apostle Paul, he condemns all false voices in his letter to the Galatians, exclaiming with great vehemence, but though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you beside that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. As we said before, so I say it again, 
If anyone preach to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. In the Apocalypse, His Majesty praises the church of Ephesus. Why? For testing those who are evil, those who say they are apostles and are not, and has found them to be liars. Our Lord was praising the Ephesians for testing the spirits. Here then is a duty we have as Catholics. A duty that must be taken with great seriousness in times like our own, when there are many, many claiming to hear heavenly voices or, or speak on heaven's behalf from some pulpit. We have a duty to discern the spirits lest we be led astray. Lest the devil coax us to leave our caves. I hope you're kissing the ground in your cave and saying, Lord, help me love my cave. I don't ever leave my vocation in life. To provide some motivation here, which I always want to do in my talks, it is important to understand that the devil is a big game hunter. Big game hunter. He's got his sights on who? On Catholics. Those are his favorite targets. Faithful, pious Catholics are big game to the devil. Those in a state of grace. Those fulfilling their duties of their state in life. Now an image of this is found in the book of Esther with the evil Haman, the evil servant of King Ahasuerus. He sees the godly Mordecai refuse to bow down to him. He has everything he needs, Haman does. But he sees Mordecai outside, unwilling to bend the knee to him. What's the result? Haman could not rest until Mordecai and all his people and those like him were destroyed. Even though he had everything he needed, he couldn't rest until they were dead. Thus, Haman exclaims, And whereas I have all these things, I think I have nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting before the king's gate. Understand then, the devil cannot rest as long as there is a single faithful Catholic still alive. He can't help it. He's driven. The Russian novelist Dostoevsky captures this well in his greatest work, The Brothers Karamazov. When the rationalistic, enlightened, and haughty brother Ivan encounters the devil and asks him about the Desert Fathers, he says, Have you ever tempted the ones who eat locusts and pray for 17 years in the barren desert? My dear, the devil answers him, I've done nothing else. One forgets the whole world and clings to such a one. Because a diamond like that is just too precious. One such soul is sometimes worth a whole constellation. We have our own arithmetic. We have our own arithmetic. One of those is worth a whole constellation. He said, it's a precious victory. If we strive to be pious and seek holiness, be assured the devil will put his sights on us. He cannot help himself. We must therefore be ready for many deceptions. We need to discern the spirits. This is a duty that we cannot escape. Returning now to the voices themselves, let us begin our discernment by making an important distinction. When the voices are of heaven, of God, they're either of the public revelation or they are private revelation. Public revelation, private revelation. Those voices of the public revelation are contained in the deposit of the faith. St. John and the other apostles and prophets of old heard these heavenly utterances and they wrote them down. They wrote down much of what they heard, but not everything. Not every single word was written down. Thus, we have a record of those voices in sacred scripture and in sacred tradition. That's the public revelation. This public revelation was forever fixed at the death of the last apostle, St. John. Thus, any additional 
communications received from heaven after that time are not considered public revelation, but private revelation. Why is this? All that has been given to the church for our salvation, all the doctrines coming forth from the mouth of God, from His majesty, the word incarnate, is complete with the death of the last apostle. Nothing more need be added. Why is that? Because the church is apostolic. The church is apostolic. Everything we believe must be traceable to the apostles. Although she may define and explain more clearly this or that doctrine of our faith as time proceeds, each and every one of them must always be apostolic in origin or it is not from God. No new doctrines are allowed. That's what we believe. That's why we're Catholic. Nevertheless, ever since the last apostle died, heavenly voices have been heard, sometimes more, sometimes less. Why is this? Is not public revelation sufficient? Is it not complete? Yes, it's complete. It certainly is. But multiple reasons exist for these additional heavenly voices, heavenly communications. For these private revelations, we need them. And here's why. Five reasons why we need them. Number one, at times, something of public revelation Something of the deposit of the faith comes under attack. And a clarification from above is needed, is helpful, lest we go astray. So here's an example. When the Protestants were revolting in Europe and destroying whole monasteries, tearing down altars, carrying out many acts of iconoclasm, the Blessed Mother appeared in Mexico on Tepeyac outside of Mexico City and gave her heavenly image to Juan Diego's on that tilma. We still have it. What's heaven saying? Heaven reaffirms the use of icons and images. The same was repeated in Paris with the miraculous medal in 1830. We can also think of other examples like St. Thomas Aquinas was struggling with a passage from the prophet Isaiah's public revelation. Something didn't make sense. He prayed, he wept, he wept, help. One night, St. Peter and Paul came and discussed things with him. Private revelation. So, number one, sometimes something of the public revelation needs clarifying. Second of all, Heaven wants to confirm or emphasize something of public revelation being neglected. Not paying attention to the right thing sometimes. So, here's an example. At times when religious life has fallen into neglect or suffered from mitigation, a voice of heaven speaks to a saint, like Teresa of Jesus, to begin anew. To restore what was lost. Here then, heaven confirms that religious life is of the deposit of the faith and is pleasing to God. Many religious orders and their special charisms come to us via heavenly commands and voices. Heaven confirms or emphasizes something of public revelations being neglected. Number three. God, being outside of time, always wants to warn his church militants passing through time of future trials. Often giving them multiple voices to make sure that we're ready when the time comes. So, in the 17th century, the most sacred heart of Jesus gave a special instruction to St. Margaret Mary to help the kingdom of France avoid her future trial of revolution. We know this story. Consecrate the country to the sacred heart. Put the sacred heart in the flag. Build a shrine. Did he do it? No. That's why we had the French Revolution. In the 20th century, Our Lady of Fatima, voice from heaven, lightning, thunder, all kinds of stuff happened. Our Lady of Fatima alerted the church of the coming of World War II. 
one of the worst disasters in the world's history. She said World War II would come if her requests were not fulfilled. Our Lady forewarned us of the clergy scandals that would happen in our own time. She warned us at Quito in Ecuador through Mother Mariana. She also warned us through the children at La Salette. So, God being outside of time warns us, watch out, something's going to happen. Number four, voices from heaven strengthen faith, hope, and charity in the believers such that they can bear present and future trials knowing the outcome ahead of time. Authentic private revelations instill courage, strength, impart virtue, improve morals. St. Joan of Arc's a good example of this with her heavenly voices. A little girl rallied grown men, hardened men, to stop blaspheming, to remain chaste, to attend daily Mass and to go to confession. That's a miracle, folks. Little girl getting those guys to do all that. As a result, her army became invincible. How's that? Heavenly voices were heard, that's how. At moments when all seemed lost, the tide suddenly turned and the victory gained and St. Joan led the charge forward, boldly. Come back, Joan, we need you today. In this way, these voices, these private revelations put on display the connection between time and eternity, between the church on earth and the church in heaven. They clearly show we're not alone, that the church is one, that God and His saints love us and have not forgotten us. They care. All of which invigorate virtue. Good to be Catholic. So voices from heaven strengthen faith, hope, and charity and enable us to do incredible trials. Okay, finally, number five. And more to the point of this mission, these heavenly communications, private revelations, increase the piety of the faithful. They increase piety. With help coming from above, piety is reinvigorated. We can look up with such ease with these heavenly voices. After the angel came, the children of Fatima, they prayed their rosaries well after that. The prayers were more complete and said more devoutly. Many today still pray the same prayers of reparation taught to them by this very angel. We have the first Friday and first Saturday devotions from private revelation. In approving the mystical city of God by Venerable Maria of Agrida, theologians stated over and over how this book, based on private revelations, was, quote, more useful for the enlivening and augmenting the piety of the faithful. Most useful for augmenting the piety of the faithful. The veneration of the Most Holy Virgin and the respect for the sacred mysteries, inspiring the reader with new fervor. New fire of love. End quote. Piety then is a strong indicator of the authenticity of the heavenly voice. It increases piety. Piety is waning. God speaks. Comes back. But now we say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Father. Since we have everything needed in the deposit of the faith, would it not be safer to ignore all private revelations since many are most surely from the devil? And the answer to that is no. That would be a dangerous shortcut. Although the mystical doctors such as St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Jesus, they teach that we should not want any private revelations ourselves that we should not desire to hear heavenly voices, lest the devil supply them, and we should be led astray, disguising himself as an angel of light, and we get confused. Now, although this be true, that we shouldn't want them ourselves, nevertheless, these same doctors do not extend the salutary warning and sound advice to rejecting or ignoring all private revelations. The brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Where did that come from? It came from a heavenly 
private revelation, St. Simon Stock. But Iskal's Carmelite restoration would not have been possible without many heavenly voices intervening. St. Teresa was in communication with all kinds of saints. St. Dominic, St. Clair, St. Peter of Alcantara. She was speaking to all these saints about what to do. True reform and restorations always come from above, not from us. Besides, if we can learn how to discern private revelations, that's among the highest level voices we're going to hear. So if we can discern that kind of thing, we can discern all things more easily. Voices coming from pulpits. Voices coming from interviews. Or any other thing. We can more easily discern everything else that comes our way in this world. Most notably the cacophony of voices emanating from the river behind us. Voices coming through blogs, radio, TV. Okay, so this is not a waste of time by any means. This is one of our duties. Again, as we just learned, God makes heavenly voices heard for a reason. Private revelation is at the service of public revelation. It helps us to live the gospel more completely, especially at difficult moments in times like our own. Listen to Pope John XXIII shortly after being made Pope in a radio address before he read the third secret of Fatima, by the way. This is what he said. The august mother of God makes her presence felt in human events in a special way. The more charity grows cold, the more urgently this mother exhorts her children to piety. There it is. Heaven speaks to increase piety, to increase virtue, to do penance for sin. And when from every side the menace of fearsome scourges increases, we feel that in her clemency she intercedes for us. There's that connection between heaven and earth. That she implores for us mercy, warding off the chastisements merited by our faults. Thus, we have a powerful patroness with a divine majesty. We have a mother who, with a heart full of pity, has compassion on her children's suffering. Hence, and this is the key line, hence, one would be placing his own salvation in jeopardy if, when he is assailed by the tempests of our world, he refused to accept her helping hand. One would be placing his own salvation in jeopardy if, when he is assailed by the tempests of our world, he refused to accept her helping hand. Given on April 28, 1959. Now, to see how true this really is, let us spend a little time reviewing how private revelations, good and bad, good and bad, are behind many of the most important moments of history. I think sometimes we don't realize just how incredibly powerful and important these things really are. Let me try to give you some examples to prove this. For nearly three centuries after our Lord ascended into heaven, the world and all its leaders gathered and persecuted the church, tortured and killed her faithful. Then Constantine received a private revelation to embrace the Holy Cross. I think he heard the voice in hoc signo vinces, or saw it written in the skies, and he put the cross on all his shields. In this sign you shall conquer. He obeyed the voice and miraculously overcame his enemies to become the emperor. Constantine legalized Christianity for the first time, initiating the social reign of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. In other words, folks, he started Christendom. A little later, Islam rises up. It's based on a private revelation. The Quran is inspired. Everybody knows it. Muhammad was illiterate. But it wasn't from a heavenly voice. Anyone who give you a gospel other than the one I got, let him be anathema. Any more need be said here? During the reign of Pope Leo the Great, Saint Leo, Attila the Hun was 
turned away from sacking Rome because he saw a private revelation of Saints Peter and Paul telling him to turn back or else. He turned around. Private revelation saved Rome. In 1208, the Immaculate Virgin came and spoke thus to the great Saint Dominic. Wonder not that until now you have obtained so little fruit by your labors. You have spent them on barren soil, not yet watered with the dew of divine grace. When God willed to renew the face of the earth, he began by sending down upon it the fertilizing rain of the angelic salutation. What's that? Hell, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Preach my Psalter, composed of 150 angelic salutations, 150 Hail Marys, and 15 Our Fathers. That's the whole rosary. And you will obtain an abundant harvest, words of Our Lady to St. Dominic. The rosary is from a private revelation given to St. Dominic. And this fact has been repeatedly verified by none other than 39 separate popes, 214 papal pronouncements and papal bulls, among them Pope Pius IX, Pope Leo XIII, Pope Pius XI, all declared the rosary originated as heaven's gift to St. Dominic. When he obeyed the request of Our Lady and prayed her Psalter, the spiritual lightnings, thunder, earthquakes, and hail soon followed. Various stubbornly rooted heresies like Albigensianism were uprooted. The invading Muslims were repelled defeated time and time again on land and on the seas, to name only a few. That's the power of private revelation. Save the day many times. St. Joan of Arc, as we've already mentioned, she heard voices that helped preserve France from England's dominion to protect France from King Henry's future demise. King Henry VIII, his future definitive split from Rome. Although many, many, many more marvelous examples could be given, the message is plain. Private revelations change things in a big way. Even the whole world, for better or for worse, depending on its source. The same is true for us individually. Recall St. Bernadette poised between the niche and the river. She heard voices from both directions. Whether we like it or not, we're in the same position. Or so it seems to me, we can either look up to the niche of the private revelations heaven has given us to endure this difficult moment in time. Revelations from Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, Ecuador, La Salette, France, Lourdes, France, Fatima, Portugal. Those come to mind. Those are very powerful. Or we can give way to the voices from the river, voices that are now at this time not as harsh. Not as harsh as they were for Bernadette, but rather they're often mesmerizing and alluring and seemingly sweet and friendly. So we need to be extra careful lest we listen and drown in these waters. St. Paul teaches us that Satan transformeth himself into an angel of light. He can be sweet. He can be consoling. He can say sweet nothings. He is ever seeking to conform himself to our desires, promising to give easy solutions to our problems with what sound like heavenly utterances. That's where we are, stuck between that river and the niche. As a big game hunter, he has fooled even great saints. Saint Ignatius of Loyola thought he was receiving heavenly consolations late into the night while studying at Paris. Until he struggled to do what? Fulfill his duties of state. And when he couldn't fulfill his duties, he said, hmm, something's not right here. And he discerned the spirits. He was falling asleep in class, among other things. And he knew then that something was wrong. He started to ignore those consolations and communications. Obviously, we must be vigilant. And discerning, ever asking, are the voices coming from heaven? How can we know? How can we stay under the umbrella of God's grace in that cave facing the niche, ignoring the voices back there? Well, in the first place, it's imperative to understand that just because something unusual is happening or extraordinary has happened, 
it does not of itself prove anything definitive about its origin. I think this is a big mistake people make today. How can it not be from God? Look how extraordinary it is. Oh, the devil is pretty crafty too. It doesn't prove anything. With the rise of rationalism, something very disconcerting has resulted. People have no fear of the devil and his wily ways. They no longer believe there is a hell. Nothing to worry about. Instead, there's all these secrets of the universe that we need to tap into. And the way to do it is through spiritualism and spiritism. So they start to open doors. They see it as a way to tap into the hidden knowledge of the universe to solve the problems facing mankind. They see no danger in doing this stuff. In fact, they're often mad and angry at the Catholic Church for stopping this information for so many years. You're not friendly to science, Catholic Church. You're not friendly to knowledge that could really help us. There's so many things about these herbs and these other things that you don't know about, Catholic Church. Magnetism and all this. It's all based upon occult principles. We're always telling people, don't do that stuff. You're going to tap into something you know what you're doing. There's a reason why we forbade that in the past. Unfortunately, it seems some of this mentality has leaked into the church. An example today would be how many people seek out Pentecostal-like experiences, having no fear of deceptions of the devil. There's no reason to fear that anymore. To make this point clear, consider for a moment a few lines from the instructions for the rite of exorcism. This is what it says. Some signs of possession are the following. Ability to speak with some facility in a strange tongue or to understand it when spoken by another. The faculty of divulging future and hidden events. Display of powers which are beyond the subject's age and natural condition. That's from the rite of exorcism. Now, these are very similar to the charismatic gifts listed by St. Paul. Knowledge, prophecy, miracles, healing, tongues, interpretation. In other words, as experienced exorcists and theologians have noted, nearly all of these charismatic gifts, which have been so popular over the last decades, have their counterparts. They have their counterparts in the diabolic. What does this mean? Just this. The fact that something extraordinary is going on is not proof of its divine origin. And it's very foolish to think it is without first carefully discerning the spirits, which is torturous to do sometimes. Also, we ought never to take the strange things caught on film as proof of anything. How many times have you had someone come to you and show, look at this picture, look at this, look what I caught on film. Look, the devil, man, can do both of those things. That doesn't prove anything. Never trust these films Pictures for anything divine. That's proof of thing. In fact, with such things, we should be even more cautious than ever, as the devils have been found hiding behind these Pentecostal movement things time and time again. And we have proof of this, St. John of the Cross. Here's what he says. Quote, Individuals who esteem these apprehensions, these spiritual experiences, are in serious error and in extreme danger of being deceived. Such manifestations are always to be considered as more surely from the devil than from God. St. John of the Cross. Such manifestations are always to be considered as more surely from the devil than from God. For the devil possesses greater leeway in influencing the exterior and corporeal part of the human nature. End quote. I sent to Mount Carmel. As the rise in occult activity and the need for exorcists show, the devil now has the broadest of permissions probably in the history of the world. Perhaps a symbol of this can be found in Lourdes as well with the repeated very damaging 
and massive floods of the river Gob in October 2012 and June 2013, reaching nearly the niche itself. It seems the devil is still trying to oust the lady from the niche. So the physical flooding in Lourdes may be symbolic of a spiritual flood in the world. That piety is being drowned in this deluge. Like I said, I firmly believe that Lourdes is the most pious place on the face of the earth. It was underwater, covered in dirt and mud. Now to discern properly, therefore, we must always begin by turning to the Lord and His church. That's where we start. It is important to note in the Gospels how our Lord did not allow error or misjudgment to go uncorrected. Read the Gospels carefully and you'll find our Lord never allowed error to continue in His presence. Recall this scene, for example, very pertinent to our subject this evening. And when it was late, the ship was in the midst of the sea and Himself alone on the land. You know the scene, the apostles are in the boat, He's on the land. And seeing them, the apostles laboring and rowing, rowing away out there, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed them by. But they, seeing him walking on the sea, thought it was an apparition, a ghost. And they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he spoke to them and said to them, Have a good heart, it is I. Fear ye not. And he went up to them and into the ship, and the wind ceased. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. Now, in the Gospel, his majesty would not allow them to think he was a ghost. He clarified, he spoke. He continues to do so through his church. Nothing can hinder this, not even a wicked prelate. Whether or not an apparition is from God, He will make sure we know it through His church to keep us from being troubled. You can look at how they declare on these apparitions. You can see this is clear. This is a declaration from the magisterium. St. Ignatius of Loyola, putting aside all private judgment, he says, we should keep our minds prepared and ready to obey promptly and in all things the true spouse of Christ, our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. That's one of his first rules for discerning. Think with the church. Thus, St. John Hughes rightly instructs the priests about their sacred duties. So-called miracles and visions should never be mentioned unless officially accepted and ratified by the church. St. John Hughes should talk about these things unless they've been ratified. Don't look into them unless they've been ratified. St. Bernadette sought out her confessor over and over, Abbe Palmion, multiple times for guidance throughout her apparitions. She was always seeking the guidance of the church. She also approached the dean of Lourdes, the Abbe Peyramal, always obeying his precepts. Now here, we must be more precise. The church speaks through her magisterium on these sorts of matters. She speaks through the teachers that are in positions of teaching. Okay, the saints of themselves are not the magisterium. St. Thomas Aquinas, the common doctor of the church, the angelic doctor, her greatest mind, as brilliant as he was, made a mistake on the Immaculate Conception. Why? Don't you think God could have prevented St. Thomas from making that mistake? Absolutely. Then why did God allow him to make the mistake? So that we would not confuse St. Thomas with the magisterium. He's a doctor. He's not the teaching authority himself. He needs the church too. That's why God allowed that. Look at St. John Vianney with all his insight into souls and things hidden. At first, he misjudged the apparition at La Salette and he had to change his view later because he realized he was wrong. 
Thus, anyone trying to raise to the level of a magisterial decision some saint's approval or disapproval of an apparition does the whole church a disfavor. This is not the path of true piety. Piety goes vertical. It goes to the church and her teaching authority, not to some saints. So I ask you, please... Do not propagate any private revelations based upon the authority of St. Padre Pio, as holy as he was, or on anybody else that's a saint. Don't say, well, Padre Pio said it's valid, it must be valid. No. St. John Vianney was wrong. St. Thomas Aquinas was wrong. St. Padre Pio was wrong, too, at times. He needs the church, too. Piety demands that we go vertical for such things, that we seek our Lord's voice expressed through the hierarchical church. At Fatima, our Lord waited until it was officially approved before coming to Lucia to request that Russia be now consecrated. He waited for his church to act. Then he came. That's a powerful message of Fatima. Since there are so many extraordinary things going on at this time, with the members of the magisterium seemingly overwhelmed with the sheer volume of it all, with many people claiming to hear heavenly voices all over the place on every continent in every country, many claiming to have charismatic gifts, while others claim the local bishop has misruled on this or that apparition, we need to spend some time learning how to discern the voices ourselves. If everything was as normal in previous centuries, we wouldn't have to do this, but we have to tonight. We need to spend some time learning how to discern these voices. In this way, we'll understand why the church acts the way she does. Furthermore, as we've seen with all the confusion surrounding the recent synod on the family and marriage, with cardinal opposing cardinal and bishop opposing bishop, with communications media adding even more confusion into the mix, all combining to reproduce the cacophony St. Bernadette heard in her time, we simply cannot afford to remain aloof. Again, what we learn here can be applied on all levels, including just discerning what to read and not to read, what to watch and not to watch, what's good for us, to listen to and not listen to. Now, unless I'm mistaken, the apparitions at Lourdes have been God-given as a wonderful model by which this can be done. Perhaps it's the most fitting and the best model of all the private revelations since public revelation has been given to us. So many things are known about it and things happen in such a manner that it really shows all the different facets of private revelation. It's fascinating to study Lourdes. Using what we've learned so far, we can compare and contrast how Lourdes fits the requirements for a heavenly voice, making it authentic as compared to other unapproved and questionable voices that have been heard ever since. Now, please note, it's very important, I'm not here to condemn definitively or outright any unapproved apparition. So I'm not going to mention any of them by name because it's not my place. I'm not the magisterium. But rather, I'm helping you discern the spirits so that you can see what is safe and not safe. Also, let us keep firmly in mind the principle that Unhesitating and fervent piety is always detached. Let's not forget that. When you're truly pious, you're ready to abandon its most cherished ideas. A person is ready to abandon his most cherished ideas the moment he discovers them to be in any way out of harmony with the church and her perennial teachings. That's piety. God doesn't see it like this. My piety says, I need to see it like God sees it. Not make him see as I see. See that? That's verticality. So let's spend the rest of our time showing how Lourdes proves, using those five things I've given you, it's an authentic apparition and how 
other apparitions, voices don't match up. Okay, number one. Does the private revelation support or detract from deposit of the faith? Does the private revelation add something new? That's the first one. How does it support the public revelation? If it adds anything or detracts from it, we know it's not from God. We know that if it causes confusion, this is not from heaven. At the time of the Lord's apparitions, all things miraculous in the sacred scriptures and tradition were under attack by the doubting and scoffing men of the Enlightenment, by the rationalists, the scripture scholars. This was even seeping into the church at the time. What is more, the Pope had just exercised his office of infallibility in defining the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. 1854. Something that was controversial for many at the time. But lo and behold, instantaneous and unexplained wonders and miracles started to multiply at the cave of Masabiel. All of a sudden, miracles of the level of the gospel were being experienced daily at Lourdes by the application of simple water from a spring. And then she came and gave us her name, a definition of herself that matches what the Pope said. I am the Immaculate Conception. Listen to Pope Pius XII make the connection. Quote, four years after the definition of the dogma, the Immaculate Virgin herself gave supernatural confirmation to the declaration of the Supreme Teacher by appearances, conversations, and miracles. End quote. So she came and confirmed what had already been publicly defined. Through a private revelation, she came. She came to confirm, to support what had already been given. No new doctrines. She countered the scoffers and the doubters with firsthand, observable, instantaneous, undeniable miracles. Awesome. In another place, the same Pope wrote this. All of this confirmed that the Catholic religion is the only one given approval by God. End quote. Now compare that to nearly every single popular unapproved apparition, especially since World War II. In these apparitions, you can find repeated theme of mitigating, mitigating, mitigating the doctrine of no salvation outside the church. It's the line in the sand. You want to test the modern apparition? See what it says about no salvation outside the church and you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's just one of them. Listen to this. Quote, Do not judge your brothers and sisters who have not been converted. Well, that's good. We're not here to judge them. That's God's job. For my father's house, my son, has repeated over and over, remember always that my father's house, there are many rooms in the mansion, signifying faiths and creeds, plural. However, the eternal father, the beatific vision, is reserved for the Roman Catholic following. This has been deemed by the eternal father since the beginning of time, end quote. Now, wait a minute. This is new doctrine. First, we're told that there are other acceptable faiths and creeds. Where St. Paul says there's only one faith. It's a gift from God to believe in Him. How can there be another faith? There isn't. The church gives us only one creed. And many, many saints have died shedding their life's blood for this creed. Furthermore, this voice claims that people can be saved, that is, be given a place in the mansions of God the Father without being given the beatific vision. In other words, there seems to be some middle position, some middle position between heaven and hell. This is new and strange doctrine. Clearly, this statement alone is enough to dismiss this voice as not being of heaven. I tell you, look at these modern apparitions and you'll find that almost all of them, without exception, mitigate no salvation outside the church. Second one, does it confirm or emphasize something of public revelation being neglected? 
with the 15 days of the Lord's apparitions lining up with the 15 decades of the rosary, the mysteries of Christ and His Holy Mother were renewed, put on display. Each day the rosary was prayed. Each day one of its mysteries was manifested on a sort of divine stage. We gave you a handout to show that. Those who had hearts and minds open to God, were enraptured and converted. Their faith was renewed. Penance was readily embraced. The same continues in that place to this very day. But even more fascinating is how the separation of church and state was overcome for the sake of the Lady of Lourdes. This separation was officially condemned by the church under Pope Pius IX. It's infallible. Cannot separate church and state. Willfully, It's a condemned proposition. But it's been promoted over and over by the secular revolutionary republics rising up since the 1700s. Before all was said and done at Lourdes, however, the church and the state worked together to make Lourdes a place of pilgrimage. A sign of this is that Jacome, the chief of police, suddenly found himself directing traffic and keeping order and kneeling down himself and joining in the prayers. Almost despite himself, if you know the story. He didn't start out that way, but that's how it ended. Circumstances made them both keep to their spheres of activity and respect each other and cooperate. There is something to think about here. It's a sort of prophecy of the future age of Mary when her immaculate heart will surely triumph. She's promised it, it will happen. And there will be only one flock and one shepherd with a great pope and a great monarch, Catholic monarch, working together for the good of all, each in their own sphere of activity. It's been prophesied, approved apparitions, voices from heaven. Yet now listen to this voice said to be of Our Lady. See if this sounds right. Quote, America, the United States in particular, is being given the tremendous yet privileged opportunity to lead all nations in a spiritual renewal, never before so necessary, so important, so vital. And it is the United States that is to lead the world to peace. If, however... The United States is faithful to this mandate from heaven and yet fails in the pursuit of peace because the rest of the world will not accept or cooperate. Then the United States will not be burdened with the punishment about to fall, end quote. Wait a minute. This does not match up with the historical fact that the United States, and I love my country, don't get me wrong, but doesn't match up. We're a free Masonic country from the foundation. We've promoted separation of church and state everywhere from our history to now. Furthermore, many very old and approved messages from heaven say all the republics will fail in a future chastisement with the world's salvation coming from the return of a great French king. How can the greatest of all the republics, the USA, be spared this fate? This supposed voice clearly smacks of Americanism, which holds that America has the key to world peace. We're doing a great job. It seems clear to me that this apparition is not worthy of our attention. It does not serve public revelation. It does not support Pope Pius IX's condemnation. In fact, it causes more confusion. Third, does it prepare us for future trials? At Lourdes, Our Lady confirmed the church's teaching of her Immaculate Conception a little over a year before Darwin would publish his first book on evolution. These two things are simply incompatible, as we described earlier in this mission. One of them has to be wrong. Can't have the Immaculate Conception and evolution of man at the same time. It doesn't work. Furthermore, the miracles worked there in Lourdes support our faith and give us courage to be Catholics. They also show how evolution is wrong. The miracles are instantaneous. 
He doesn't gradually get better. Most of the miracles are instantaneous. Bang! Just like creation. Well, anyway, listen to this radio address of Pope John XXIII. Once again, shortly after he was elected Pope and before he read the third secret, he said, Following those pontiffs who for a century recommended that Catholics pay attention to the message of Lourdes, we urge you to listen with simplicity of heart and an upright mind. Here it is. To hear the salutary warnings of the Mother of God, warnings still relevant today. Pope John the Twenty Third. What's the relevant warning? Penance, penance, penance. Fatima showed that this message is still valid and needs to be fulfilled in order to prevent the wrath of God coming upon us. Shortly after Bernadette finished the 15 days, Lord suffered from an outbreak of false and fake apparitions that shocked everyone, that either mocked or parodied the real thing. So there's all these little devilish apparitions happening right after Lord's was over, the 15 days. In their own way, these shams of the devil indicate and prefigure what could be expected in the future, namely our own times, our own times. As it turns out, nearly every post-World War II apparition attempts to legitimize itself by making a connection to the approved apparitions, usually Lourdes and Fatima. Furthermore, nearly all of them try to imitate or parody something of them. For example, instead of the miracle of the sun, in one of them people stare into the sun, not just once, but frequently, many of them damaging their eyes, and even going blind. Is this from God? If the children at Fatima received Holy Communion from an angel, then others will do the same, but this time before a whole crowd. So we can see them. Their warnings are often confused. Repetition of what has already been stated at La Salette, Lourdes, and Fatima. Many of them make prophecies that have not come true. And what is perhaps most serious at a time when we are barraged with information, unbelievable amount of information in the world today, overloaded with words, nearly all of these post-World War II voices are unending. They're long-winded, they're wordy, producing many, many volumes of messages. How does this help us overcome the trials of this time? How does it prepare us for future trials and clarify church doctrines? It does not. Their prophecies have not come true. They've caused lots of confusion. No, these are not worthy of our attention. Number four, does the communication strengthen virtue in the visionary and in the faithful to bear present trials? I do not promise you happiness in this life, but in the next. Without doubt, the Lord's apparition strengthened Bernadette for heroic trials. At times, she seemed completely alone in her defense of the truth and goodness of the lady. She was threatened with jail time. She was told to get out of there by demons, as well as family and friends. When all finally saw that she was right, they attacked her in a new way, bothering her day in and day out, probing questions and inappropriate remarks, trying to make her tell her secrets, and so on. Truly, she proved the veracity of the apparitions with her very life, with her virtue. What is more, she never spoke of them on her own, nor did she go to the grotto on her own. She was pushed by God, moved by His grace, and she piously sought permissions for all she did. The Abbe Pamian echoed the conclusion of many. The best proof of the apparitions is Bernadette herself. Many converted just visiting with her alone. One priest broke down after he tried and tested her. He said she's ignorant about things of the faith because she didn't know her catechism very well, but she's worth more than I am. I am worthless. She gave consistent and stable testimony. She did not try to dazzle, we find. She refused all money, all gifts of any kind. Thus, she would never agree to the globe-trotting that we see now, some of these visionaries 
who see and hear things whenever and wherever they want them. She would never promote herself in any way. In fact, she seemed to be one thing that would upset her, her sense of virtue and piety, was when people would try to promote her. Once someone said, if I could only cut off a small piece of her dress. She heard this, causing her to turn around and say curtly, oh, how very stupid you are. (laughs) Modern apparitions, what do we got? Wishy-washy seers. They're forgetful, changing their mind, doing all for show, for gain. Not surprisingly, the shipwreck of divorce is often found around many of these apparitions. Once again, the best proof of their inauthenticity are the visionaries themselves. Finally, do the heavenly voices, the private revelations, the voices, huh, increase the piety of the faithful? It was Our Lady that taught St. Bernadette how to make the sign of the cross with great devotion piously kiss the ground for sinners. Of Lourdes and its effects, Pope Pius XII said that from that, all that had happened at the grotto, faith was aroused. Devotion was enkindled. The faithful strive to conform their lives to Christian precepts. Think of the daily processions, the singing of hymns, the praying of the rosary, the long lines of confessions and all the miracles. Lord's is a pious place, to be sure. What is more, the approved apparitions of the church always have their own chapels. What I'm going to tell you now, I think, is probably one of the most important things of all. These apparitions that are approved by the church have their own chapels or basilicas, liturgical feasts, prayers, and devotions. Yet nearly every single post-World War II apparition does not even have its own church. No place to call home. No place to make a connection between heaven and earth through the mass. No place to be pious. Does not this say everything? At Lord's, nothing, nothing stopped Our Lady, the Virgin Most Powerful, Virgo Potens, from conquering every single authority, both inside and outside the church, to have a chapel raised on Massabiel. Nothing got in her way. No local bishop got in her way. No local pastor. Her chapel would be built. Period. Not true of these modern apparitions. They've all tried. They're all denied. There are many, many more things that could be considered. We have children yelling for long periods. If you look at some of them, they're yelling for hours out of fear. Does that build your piety at all? Walking backwards uphill, wow, that makes my piety just swell. Head craned back unnaturally. One claims our lady's birthday was really August 5th. So we've been wrong all these years. The church was wrong. Church is liturgical year. We've been wrong all this time. How do these things build piety? They don't. They attack it. They're not worthy of our attention. Now, there are many more things that could be considered, but I think we have enough to keep us focused on the niche and ignoring the cacophony of voices from the river, keeping it behind us. To do this well, to be active and discerning, We must keep our piety in place. How are we going to do that? Number one, as St. John the Cross indicated, most apparitions are false. Don't forget that. Most are false. Not true. Two, learning to discern private revelations can help us discern all the voices we hear in this time and claiming to speak for heaven via homilies, speeches, interviews, whatever. If we can learn what we just learned about apparitions, we can apply that to everything. Is this increasing our piety? It's not. We're in trouble. Number three, unhesitating and fervent piety is detached. It's ready to abandon its most cherished ideas the moment it discovers them to be in any way out of harmony with the church and her perennial teaching. Piety seeks not its own special findings, but what can be gathered from the deposit of the faith as presented by the church and her fathers and doctors. 
Piety, in other words, repels novelties and innovations while loving and embracing tradition and authority. So if it has its sights on something and thinks it's right, but yet learns it's not, it lets go. Get away. I don't want you to hurt my piety. Number four, godliness keeps to the vertical, not allowing emotions and sentimentality to influence our decisions. Piety knows that God can use various means to convert people, even allowing them at times to pass through an unapproved false apparition to find the truth on the other side. So we need to be patient with those who are under one of these spells from these things. Finally, seems that a certain form of Marcionism has returned with the modern era. Marcion, from the early part of the church, one of the earliest heresies, he held that the God of the Old Testament was not the same as the God of the New Testament. The earlier Hebrew God being of justice and the later one of the New Testament, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is one of mercy. With all the post-World War II apparitions, one would think Our Lady before that time is different from the Lady that comes after, which, of course, is false. It puts on display, rather, that these voices are not hers. Thus, a warning is fitting here. Our Lady said at Fatima, World War II would be a chastisement. These false voices are, in fact, distractions. Efforts flowing from the river to keep us, make us turn from the saving messages of Lourdes and Fatima to leave our caves where piety is fueled, verticality is renewed, and immobility is secured. And as we heard at the beginning of this conference, When St. Bernadette arrived at the grotto on March 25th, Our Lady was already there, standing in the niche, looking down and smiling upon the pilgrims. By acting in this way, she is telling us something. I'm still there. I will be here. This is my tabernacle on earth. No wonder there have been two major floods in recent years trying to unsuccessfully to dislodge her from that hollow place in the wall. Let us remain with her, staying focused upon her in that niche, come what may. Would you do me the kindness of coming one more night? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.